everyone. Welcome to the show today. I'm excited for our guest. He is a social media guru, uh, Brendan Kane, speaker and author. He actually recently re uh, released a book called Hook Point, How to Stand Out in a Three-Second World. We're going to kind of get into that a little bit. Um, welcome to the show, Brendan. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to connect with you and everybody that's listening to this. Yeah, so just... Um, just so you know, my audience is, it consists mostly of um, entrepreneurs. I've got people that, you know, have, you know, several multi-million dollar businesses. I have people that they haven't, you know, made the leap yet. They're, you know, they're trying to get things in order so that they can kind of pull the trigger on their business. Um, so with that in mind, tell us a little bit about your journey and what brought you kind of into the profession that you're in. And, you know, I, I know that you do, you add a lot of value to entrepreneurs, um, so can you kind of tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah. So initially I wanted to be a film producer. So I, I went to film school to hopefully learn about the business side of entertainment, the entertainment industry and business in general. And when I showed up, I just quickly realized they teach you nothing about business there. So I had to find a way to really learn on my own. And the most uh, effective way that I, that I believed at the time was to start your own business. So I started a few uh, internet companies while I was going to college, really just to learn and experiment. And then when I moved to Los Angeles in around 2005, like anybody else, I started at the bottom. You know, I started making coffees and copies and deliveries. And when people would ask me, well, what do you want to do? Why did you move to LA? It, you know, my response was, I want to be a film producer, but I could see everybody's eyes glaze over, you know, because I was just one of a million other people with the same aspirations. So I knew I needed to find a unique way to, to stand out and grab attention of the studio executives, of just directors and actors and uh, things of that nature. And I would just see that whenever we finished a film, something that we would spend tens of millions of dollars to produce a single piece of content, uh, there would be a sense of anxiety and stress that would come over the studio office that I was working at because we have to then make sure that hundreds of millions of people around the world know about the single piece of content. Otherwise we really risk uh, right. losing a ton of money. It's a, it's a huge investment and it's a completely different industry where you're building brands overnight. You don't have years or decades to do it. So seeing that stress and anxiety, I basically uh, just went up to you know the heads of the studios and said, listen, I have this experience in, in, in understanding digital platforms and traffic acquisition and social media was just coming on the scene. And I was said, I can develop strategies for you that will essentially um, get your, your movie or your trailer out to the masses for either little cost compared to what we were spending on television and radio and print. Uh, and in some cases, no cost at all um, because it was so early. Uh, so that's where I was able to effectively, you know, go from making coffee to building a digital division for the first studio that I worked for in under a year and a half. And uh, just, I did that for a few years and just realized that unfortunately the movie industry is just another corporation and I'm not cut out for that corporate world. Uh, I'm more of an entrepreneur. So then I went back to building technology platforms in my own companies and, and licensing them back and partnering with big media organizations. So, you know, I have a lot of listeners that um, they think that social media is daunting, man. They're like, you know what, I'll, you know, I'll do some, I'll run some pay-per-click ads. I'll do some tradi traditional marketing. What are some things that they can do to kind of, um, you know, get, get going a little bit? You know, I, I feel like um, you know, it's, it's really easy to spend a million dollars in social media marketing and not really get a lot of traction. So those kind, kind of two separate questions there. One, how, how does somebody get started Two, once they get kind of a, a budget, how do they know that their dollars are going to like something that's going to benefit some, something's going to have an ROI attached to it. So the, the best place to start is doing research, researching your competitors, researching other people that have been successful in the space and get a fundamental understanding of what's driving their success. So we do this on all aspects of it. And we still do it today. I've been in social media since 2005, back to Friendster and MySpace, and we're still learning constantly every day. We, we, don't, we don't ever stop. So organic 
you know, social, you can learn by looking at people's accounts, seeing what's working, what's not working, uh, identify formats, structures, uh, tonality, you know, cadence, all of that, and see how it can be duplicated for your message, your content. The paid side, fortunately, there's been a lot of changes over the past few years with everything that happened with Cambridge Analytica and the transparency that that these platforms feel responsible for and kind of pressured to by the government. So what that means is Facebook has a Facebook ad library. You can go in and type any company and research the active ads that they're currently running. You can even click on the links and see the landing pages. You can buy the products and go through the post email sequences and all of that. LinkedIn has a similar platform for LinkedIn ads. Uh, one, of the tool, one of the tools that I do is every ad that gets popped up into my feed, I engage with it. So the algorithm serves me more, to, more ads so that I can keep seeing what people are doing. But the beauty of these platforms, especially when you talk about paid media, is it's attribution-based. Like, unless you're doing an offline sale, which you can still attribute back, it's a little bit more challenging, but there's platforms out there like a a wicked reports and things like that, that you can pipe right back into your CRM. But most people I would say are probably doing some type of online transaction is like, you can track that. You can see for every dollar that you spend, you get X number of dollars in return. So you don't need to spend, you know, start off spending a million dollars. Uh, you can start spending small to see how you can prove it out. See if you're having success and you're driving that conversion and then scale from there. Now, one of the, the things that, and why I like platforms like the Facebook ad library and, and the LinkedIn ads and studying other people's ads is advertising doesn't just come down to the creative that you're putting in front of people. It also comes down to what is the landing page that you're sending to them? What is the post follow-up uh, cadence? What is your retargeting strategy? All these fall into place in terms of really maximizing every dollar you spend. Because I see a lot of people burn a lot of cash because they're starting with uh, just the ads and then they're throwing it to a landing page. It's not optimized or they don't have a retargeting campaign or they don't have like an, a, a way to really follow up or optimize that process. And then it falls flat. It was one of the mistakes that I made early on is you think you just put something in front of people and they automatically buy, but it doesn't really work that way. There's a lot of detail that goes into it, but to, to circle back to the original question, is it daunting? Sure. It is daunting, but it's like anything that you want to get good at. It's like, if you feel overwhelmed, that's a sign that you're on the right path. I still get overwhelmed sometimes in, in this business as I'm learning, but you just take it one step at a time. It's just like the first step is just study what other people are doing. Use those references to guide you on what to do and what not to do, because those people have come before you and probably spent a ton of money figuring this out. And then you can leverage that expertise that they've kind of spent to, to apply it to your brand. Yeah. And I love this idea of not reinventing the wheel, kind of going out there, seeing what's seeing what's out there. A lot of my listeners are, they're freaking busy, man. They're, and they're, and, and, and a lot of them are, they're entrepreneurs. So they're not really, and myself included, I'm not really an expert at anything. I'm just kind of good at a lot of different things. And I have, I hire experts. That's yeah. what I do. And so um, but somebody that doesn't have necessarily the resources to hire somebody, I don't know. Do, do you recommend that they kind of get into the nuts and bolts of this? Or is it like, hey, m- maybe you hold off until you have the resources because it feels like um, there's just so much to it. Um, even the terminology that you toss around is super casual. A lot of my listeners aren't going to really understand what what those things are. Is this, is this a field, a social media field where it's complicated to the extent that um, you really need an expert? Uh, yes and no. I mean, listen, and, and I'm sure you, you've gained this from your experience in entrepreneurs. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to be, know enough to be dangerous. So it's like, to me, I've seen people being burned by hiring experts. I've been burned by hiring 100%. experts. 100%. It's, just, it's really knowing at least the right questions to ask. Uh, that's where you can get knowledge for free on YouTube, or you can read books like our books or things of that nature. Do you have to get into the nuts and bolts to it? 
you don't have to, it just depends on kind of what stage you're at. I think it, it's beneficial to dig in uh, if you can, just again, so that you can at least ask the right questions. Uh, but it, it also depends on the type of business that you're in. Like we advise a lot of businesses. We, we work with pre-revenue companies all the way up to 25 billion in annual revenue. And those pre-revenue companies or those entrepreneurs that are just starting out, you know, if they're a consultant, if they're a service-based business, uh, if they're a coach or something like that, well, then we can do things to kind of just get in front of the right people, whether that's cold email outreach or LinkedIn, or maybe we get ourselves in some podcasts or things like that. So you can kind of jumpstart the revenue so that you have money to then invest into a specific expert. Now, these things do require a certain level of of knowledge and expertise. That's not to say that I haven't seen people at, like their first ad, they're profitable. For some people I've seen that they tried to run ads for two or three years and it's not profitable. Uh, each business is is a little bit unique and and different, but you know, at a, at a high level, at least know the basics of how these systems work. Like to give you a funny example is when they put Mark Zuckerberg in front of, I think it was either Congress or the Senate, they didn't even know Facebook's business model. They didn't even know that Facebook is supported by advertising. Like you can't go into situations like that with such little knowledge or expertise because that's how you get burned. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and, and that's the thing is that, you know, entrepreneurs, um, a lot of times they start with a specialty, right? They're a home builder or you know, a designer or something, and they have to learn how to create a business. And I always say that I'm glad I didn't understand or know beforehand what it was going to take, because if I did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it. I would just be I'm the same way. Five. Even today, I, I, I just start things. I have no idea what I'm really getting into. I kind of have a vision and it turns out, as you said, to be completely different. And we really knew probably would never do it because it's, yeah, it's difficult, but you know, you bring up an interesting point for like some of those people that are like home builders or, uh, or just, I mean, I did this in my business. One of the easiest ways to grow your business, if you're not like selling t-shirts or like CPG products, uh, if you're going after like kind of clients and things like that is, is find like strategic partners that can introduce you. Like, you know, I found that in the course of my career is that I would find like super connectors. Like I don't like networking. I frankly hate the term networking because I think it has negative connotations to it. And I'm an introvert. So I would expend all of my energy into a few select people, like one or two people that I just knew were super connected. And if I could find a way to provide value to them or to strike, strike some type of partnership, they open up the doors to so many potential clients and businesses so if people are in that type of uh, client service uh, or consulting uh, business, like that's an easy way that you don't have to leverage, you know, social media or social media ads to get started, build your profitability, build your revenue stream, and then go back and reinvest in it. So kind of along those same lines. So for let, let's, let's take the example of like a home service business, you be what it may HVAC, plumbing, pest control, landscape, whatever, window washing. Um, there's some def definitely some opportunity in social media for those types of businesses. Um, what are your thoughts just off the cuff regarding um, using influencers for that type of thing versus, versus a, a, a paid ad? Yeah. So for that, type of business, would I use influencers? Yes, but not the influencer or the term that you think of. So I would focus on, you know, who is the top real estate agent in the market? Who is, you know, on the government council? Or if you're a plumber, who does floor remodeling? Or if you do floor remodeling, who installs pools? Things like that, that are not your typical influencers. And it's not about online influence, it's more about offline influence that you can create strategic strategic partnerships or relationships with to, to, to really get into those clients, um, those clients that way. Now, if you were to do some paid advertising, I would primarily focus on like paid search uh, and maybe even some Yelp advertising. Uh, social media advertising for those businesses, it can work, but that's a little bit more advanced. And the reason I say it's more advanced is there's a big distinction 
between cold traffic and warm traffic. So cold traffic is social media. You're pushing things. They're not searching for your product or service. They're just scrolling through their feeds and you're pushing an ad to them versus warm traffic is like Yelp or Google. People are actually searching for what you have to offer. So they're actually looking for that. Thus, they're a warmer audience. Now, there's obviously pros and cons to both. Warm traffic is typically far more expensive. So you're going to pay a higher cost right. per click, a higher cost per lead because they know that it's warm traffic and because there's uh, competition direct, directly for those keyword terms. Uh, social traffic is, again, you're pushing, so it's not warm, but it typically is lower cost in terms of that cost per click, but the conversion rate may not be as high. So typically, if you're a business just getting into it, like especially a local business, step one, I was I would just you know create as many of those influencer relationships, and again, redefining influencer in this case of it doesn't have to be an online influencer or like a TikTok star, somebody that has connections and already works with all the clients you have, and then two, go after those warm traffic sources, pay per click advertising on the search engines, and in also places like Yelp. Is there any space anymore for organic, um, organic traction in, in yeah. social? It's it, I feel like Instagram's so loud and it, w- it's hard. What is it? I mean, listen, it's always been hard. It's harder now because there's just more content, and because there's more content, you know, there's 3.96 billion people on social media, and amongst those people, not everyone's producing content every day, but there's 100 billion messages sent out into the world every single day through these platforms. <laughs> so the algorithms have to prioritize what content to seed to people because if any of us open any social app right now, there's probably a thousand pieces of content the algorithms can push to us because of all the people we follow and the content we've engaged with. Now, obviously, if you open up an app, it can't send you a thousand pieces as soon as you open it up, you get overwhelmed and you close it. So it has to determine, okay, what are the top 15 out of this thousand that I believe is going to keep this person on this platform longer? Because that's how they make money. Right. They make money by serving they more need your ads. Attention. They serve more ads the longer you stay on the platform. So when it chooses those 15 pieces of content is under that premise of what is the content that we're seeing from an analytical perspective that's holding attention for as long as possible. So that means 985 out of a thousand posts are getting deprioritized and most likely not going to make it to you. So when people talk about organic being difficult, yeah, it's difficult because of that. But if you understand the principles and there's only two things you have to master, uh, it isn't easy, but it's simple. Uh, Number one, are you stopping the scroll? Are you grabbing that attention? Because if you don't, if you don't stop the scroll, the algorithm first sees that right away. And they're like, we're suppressing the reach on this. But number two, once you stop the scroll, how long are you holding that attention for in the story you're telling? If you do those two things, the algorithms will love you and you'll get reach. Now, the problem that people run into is they're, they're listening to and using guidance and tactics that were designed five, six, seven, in some cases, 10 years ago when there was less people on the platform. Right. So advice like frequency is everything. Post as many times as you can. Um, hashtags are key. All, it, it's not like, it's a quality over quantity game because if you're just posting and using hashtags and but your content is not grabbing attention and holding attention, you're actually training the algorithm that you're not a good content creator and thus it's going to make it harder and harder to get that reach. It's not to say that if you've been doing that, that you can't get out of that, you know, sandbox, that penalty box, you can, but is there's just so much misinformation and there's such little strategy that goes into it. When again, it's not easy, but it's simple. You just master those two principles and you will succeed no matter pl- what platform you're going out there for. So would you say that for somebody that's just trying to get some traction on social media, maybe just started their company Instagram uh, page or profile, that it's a mistake to go just quantity off the bat? Are you are you suggesting that they be more deliberate and maybe post only, uh, I don't know, once a week in sake of quality? Well, it's 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 two things. It's definitely quality over quantity, but quality is kind of a difficult term because some people will think quality is like production value and fancy cameras and lighting. It's not. We're talking about quality is 
playing to those two principles? Are you, are you grabbing attention and holding that attention? So for us, 100%, I'd rather see somebody spend a week or two weeks or even three weeks on a single post and just really wow. analyze and research other content creators, determine what's working, what's not working, and then apply that philosophy to a single piece of content. And that doesn't mean that you have to spend a lot of money producing it. You could do it on your iPhone. Like I know people that create videos on their iPhone that go, that go viral and, and learn from it. The most important thing is, are you learning? Because if you're just, whether you're posting 10 pieces of content a week or one, if you're not measuring the results and seeing if your hypothesis held true and then using those learnings for the next test, then you're, you're never going to grow. So that's kind of the most important thing. Like if you can post, you can create 10 pieces of content and you're really learning and you're researching and iterating, then great. But I, again, I'd rather you spend more time on one if you're not going through that extensive process uh, than to, to just churn out content for the sake of churning it out. I read a book, um, one of Gary Vaynerchuk's early books. I think it was something like Jab, 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 Right Hook or something. The concept was, for businesses, don't always be asking for something, right? Give, give value, give value, give value, give value, then ask for something. Do you agree with that kind of basic principle? I, I do. I, I would like to recontextualize a little bit is to me, yes. And I talk a, a bit about providing value, but to me, it's what is the problem that you're solving? You know, what, what problem are you solving for the person? And that's a form of value. But to me is value, I think, can be a vague term in that some people can misinterpret like what value really means. And again, I use the word a lot uh, and I'm a huge believer in providing value. Uh, but to recontextualize it as like, what is the, the end problem that we're solving for somebody? Because if you're solving, and I challenge anybody listening to this, is just think about the thing that keeps you up at night. And this can be personal or professional. The thing that stresses you out more than anything. And then just imagine I come to you and say, hey, I know you're experiencing this, this huge problem and I know it's really yeah. painful. I would love to solve it for you. Would you allow me to do that? Like, what are you going to say? Who doesn't want their greatest problem solved? So that's where it's like... Um, you know, I don't like selling. I personally don't like selling. And I, I think that that's where typically it goes wrong is people are trying to focus on the sale instead of what is the, what is the problem that we're solving for, for this individual? I, I love the way you think about that. Um, and, and entrepreneurs, we get that, right? Cause that's what our entire business was probably created around, right? We, we wanted to solve a problem or provide a convenience or, or, you know, build value with, with our business. And I think that's a great way for businesses to kind of reconsider their social media strategy, myself included. Sometimes we're just like, Hey, let's just get something out there. But if we're not helping somebody solve a problem, um, it doesn't sound like we're building a whole lot of value with what we're, you know, with that content that we're producing. A hundred percent. And just to take it a step further, one of the biggest mistakes uh, people make in terms of creating this content, whether it's paid or organic, is they, they may be actually solving a problem, but they're solving the wrong problem okay. because, or at least leading with the wrong problem. Because there's a big difference between needs and wants. You know, what the consumer needs may not be what they want. And you have to really lure, lead with what they want. So to give you an example, is my first book, One Million Followers. I am leading what the consumer wants. They want to figure out how they can generate a lot of followers, how they can generate a social audience. But what I know they need is they need to understand what testing is about, research that we just talked about, what hook points are, what um, strategic partnerships are, uh, how the value of a paid advertising platform, how to test content. But if I led with any of those, I probably would not have sold as many books. That's yeah, kind of boring. It's not what people yeah. want to hear, right? Yeah, it's... but if you start with, hey, if you really want followers, I can show you the way, but you need to learn these other things in order to master that. So I am still providing what I know the consumer needs, but I'm not leading with it. 
And that's where a lot of entrepreneurs and custom or um, consumer facing products and brands that we work with are often struggling to scale is they're, they're tapping into a core audience that's already bought in. But as we all know, like scale is going after the general audience. And that's where we have to reposition and recontextualize the message to bring them to the, the path that you know they need to have. But if you lead, it oftentimes really causes issues. Yeah. And I, no, I'm on board 100%. And I wanted to switch gears um, for just a second before I do that. Um, what, what do you say to people that are like, well, isn't that a bait and switch? Aren't we talking about like leading with something and then, um, you know, providing something else? No, because it's, it's solving what they want. It's saying, like in my case, okay, you want followers, then I need to teach you these, these five things. So it's not completely, it's not a bait and switch at all because we're delivering on what they came for. We're just saying in order to deliver that, you need to do these things. Now, if those things that you're saying that they need to do don't correlate to the result that they came in from, then yes, that's bait and switch. But it's definitely not. Like to give you another example is like, let's just say you have a heart attack and you go into the doctor and he's, you know, says, okay, we really, you really need to kind of relax yourself. You're under too much stress and anxiety. And that individual has always had a huge negative connotation towards meditation. He's like, I'm never going to do meditation. I don't believe in it or anything. And this guy goes into the doctor and, you know, he, he basically almost dies. And the doctor saying, listen, if you do not relax yourself, you are going to die. And he's like, okay, doctor, I will do whatever I have to do. And then the doctor prescribes, well, you need to start meditating every day. I guarantee you that person is going to be far more receptive to meditation than they ever were because it's fulfilling a specific, you know, desire to stay alive, you know, and, but the doctor is saying you need to do this. But if the doctor led before a heart attack and said, you need to meditate and the guy yeah. hates meditation, he's probably not going to be, you know, receptive to it. Great. Yeah, no, it makes 100% sense there. So I read something that said that TikTok was the number one downloaded app last year in 2020. Um, I was surprised a little bit by that. Um, I want to get your thoughts about TikTok and I wanted to get um, your thoughts also in the context. So your overall thoughts and then also in the context for entrepreneurs. Is there room for businesses on TikTok? Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, again, it starts back to the thing that I mentioned early on is doing the research, finding the references, like see how uh, a doctor uses TikTok or Gary Vee uses TikTok or somebody else that's doing it successful and unsuccessfully. So can it be used for that? Yes. Does that mean it's the necessary or it's a necessary component or it's the right fit for your business? Not necessarily. Like I choose not to spend a lot of time on TikTok. It's not because there isn't value there. It's not that you can't be successful, but we, we really focus on one platform at a time to get really good at it. And, you know, with any of these mm. platforms, there's pros and cons to it. Uh, so uh, you've got to really understand why you're choosing a platform and not just to choose it because it's the number one downloaded app or because they have all these users, because there's other platforms, there's LinkedIn, there's YouTube, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's Twitter. All of these have a lot of users on it. All of them have value in some way, shape or form. So to me, it's like really understanding the consumption behavior of how each of the consumers use the platform, uh, what actually it takes to produce content for these platforms, because each platform takes a specific type of, um, content production and, and, and strategy to it. So I kind of look at it from that perspective. I don't look at it as like a, a black and white answer. And I certainly wouldn't make a determination of, oh, TikTok is the number one downloaded app last year. So that means I have to be on it because that's not the right decision uh, or, or the right data point to make a decision to go into it. I really like, I'm actually curious about this statement that you said that you guys focus on one platform at a time, right? As businesses, we feel like, hey, right when we open our doors, we need a Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
you know, LinkedIn, like everything that we can get our hands on. Yeah, I don't, I don't personally, I don't buy into that because then how would you get good at any one of them? You it don't, just, right? Yeah, it's you're just, just polluting your effort effect. and you're not, and you're not. Now, is that to say that you can't find use cases of people that are good at all platforms? No, I could tell you some people right away that I've seen be good at them, but it is hard to do that, especially if you're just getting into, into social media. And to me, it's like, let's just focus on one that we believe is the right for our goals and let's hit the ceiling with it. Let's figure it out and get really good at it. And then once we're really good at it, then we can move to the next one and do the same thing and then keep going from there. But going back to what we were talking about with the algorithms, the world that we live in today, it's very difficult to get good just at one platform, let alone trying to manage five at the same time. I just, um, I just warn people against that. So I've heard that kind of newer platforms, you can get a little traction more easily than more developed platforms. And I think that's why I've heard a little bit about people focusing on LinkedIn, focusing on TikTok versus a Facebook or Instagram. Do you, do you buy into that? Should that go into someone's consideration when deciding which platform they should start with? Is what you're saying true? Yeah, you can. If you do it right, it just doesn't, it doesn't mean because you get on a platform early mean you're going to win. Because there's plenty of people that were on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn early on maybe the first few users and they're, they didn't have success. So there's no guarantee in that. My personal philosophy is I'd rather be late. I'd rather be late. Let the platform actually prove itself as a mature platform. Let other people prove out what works and what doesn't work. And then, you know, determine, okay, is this the right fit? Do I want to go in this, in this direction? Uh, but it's interesting you bring up like LinkedIn and TikTok, like people think they're new platforms. They've been around for a long time, especially TikTok. It was it used to be musically. It's I don't know exactly how long, but it's been at least six or seven years, maybe even longer that it's it's been out. But that's that's my personal philosophy. I mean, all of this is just my personal philosophy. It's like every person has to make the right decision for them. And there's not one way to be successful in any aspect of this. Yeah. And I think when, when I say new, I, I, I feel like, um, it's just, those platforms just aren't as noisy. They're still, they're still noisy, but not like Instagram. Right. Um, and, and I feel like, uh, there's just a little, it, it feels a little easier to grab some traction on those, but I, I agree a hundred percent that, um, that shouldn't be the determining characteristic, right? A, a business owner, entrepreneur has to say, okay, well, this platform actually matches the content we want to make, which matches what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I think that also is really defining what does traction mean for you? Because like our core formula of developing, you know, scale for our clients is it's called a hook point formula. And there's three components. It's one, do you, how can you grab attention? Because if you don't grab attention, you get lost in the noise. Number two, how do you hold attention? Because if you grab attention, it has no substance. It doesn't mean anything. But third, and just as important, is monetizing attention. How does it play to the overall business and goals? So sure, could it be easier to go on TikTok and get 100,000 or a million views than potentially Instagram? Yeah, but what does that mean? Does that, does that drive anything for your core business? Now, maybe it does, and that's great, but that's a question that you have to ask yourself is attention for the sake of tension or traction for the sake of traction doesn't necessarily mean you're actually driving the business results that, that you're going after. Yeah, and so are, are you suggesting that business owners really need to kind of create objectives before you know attempting to go after one of these platforms? Like, hey, this is these are kind of our strategies. This is, these are the things we're trying to accomplish. And from there, start making decisions about social media. A hundred percent. Like I will not work with a client until we set a, a strategy. You know, we start with our clients of, you know, spending about 30 to 45 days of us mapping out a key strategy for them of, of what, what is the right platform? What is the right strategy? Where should we go? How should we tackle this? What is the progression of all of that? Because otherwise you're just jumping in and you don't even know what success looks like or how to get success or how to measure it. 
in any event. And that's where people get lost. That's where people get frustrated and feel like they're not fulfilling uh, their goals or, or getting lost in the noise. And, you know, it's interesting. You, you can, you know, and I know people that have millions of followers that don't have don't have a lot of revenue success and in, in brand scalability. And I know people with tens of thousands of followers that are making millions of dollars a year. It just, it really just comes down to uh, the right, the right approach specific for your goals, for your business, for your customer base and designing for that. Yeah. I love it, man. I wish I had another couple of hours to discuss this. Very interesting stuff. And my listeners, we don't, they don't hear a lot about this. I don't have a lot of, um, you know, people with this level of digital marketing expertise on as much as I should. And so um, just, hey, I wanted to thank you, Brendan. Where can people find out more about you? Where can they download your books and just kind of learn about all the great things that you're up to? Yeah, if they want to learn about the the work that we do with clients and our process, or even just download uh, a deck presentation that walks through it, they can go to hookpoint.com. I would recommend between the two of my books is starting with the hook point book because it really sets a foundation for everything that we talked about. And they can go to uh, book.hookpoint.com. Also, both of my books are on Amazon. Uh, but if you just go to that URL, you get some additional add-ons and bonuses that I obviously can't deliver through the Amazon platform. Great. Love it. Well, thanks for joining us today, Brandon. Best of luck in the future, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a rating. And for daily inspiration and business tips, follow Alan on Instagram. Until next time, remember, we build the future one entrepreneur at a time.